we get started this morning, I wanted to start with a few announcements, and certainly we like to celebrate the accomplishments of our members, and Mary Ashley Calloway, and Sherry Krigger, and Emily Bass, and Fair Rollins completed a half marathon yesterday, and Amy a full marathon in Memphis. We want to give them pats on the back, so good job, girls. Also, I uh, got word that Mary Northcutt and the rest of the girls' swim team over at Grissom got second in state based on points. So that's a fantastic accomplishment. And also, we celebrate with the Madison Academy football team when Eric Cohue and Granville LaCroix and Chris Hirschfield, just a fantastic season coming up just short. Let's show them. We look forward to next year and have a lot of uh, great returning players. So should be awesome. Um, attendance. We are on pace to either come close or even eclipse our highest number of folks that have ever attended on Sunday mornings here at, at Twickenham. The Lord has been uh, very good in adding to our number each week, and uh, we have experienced some growing pains over the past couple of years, and that's a, a good thing. Um, one of the things that's allowed us to um, experience some growth is adding an additional service, uh, but unfortunately, our two worship times are not exactly numerically balanced. Um, so many of the faithful folks that are coming to our 8 o'clock service are being utilized every week for prayers and also to pull off communion and stuff, so we're going to ask uh, that each of our members, whether you be a single, a couple, or a family, we're going to ask that one month in the year 2012 that you come to our first service. We've got some sign-up sheets in the lobby, and we're going to ask you to sign up. So go with your favorite lunch buddies. You, hey, we'll all go march, okay? Or people from your class, however you want to do it. But in all three lobbies, we've got sign-ups. And you're probably thinking, a month, how can I do that? Hey, Southwood Presbyterian sends their folks to another church for a whole quarter. And uh, in Atlanta, Andy Stanley's church, uh, every other Sunday they're in the gym. So we're just asking for a month. Please help us out with that. And I know that you'll be blessed uh, if you'll, you'll do that. We're also experiencing some growing pains in our ABFs. Uh, many of our classes are at capacity, or you've got maybe one or, or two empty chairs at the most. Um, so Steve Krieger has been working on responding to that need, and we're going to be offering a new adult Bible class starting in January. So if you're not connected with the Bible class right now, uh, or maybe you don't like the people you're currently with, uh, we are starting a new class, and it's for anyone, all ages, and it's going to be more of a discussion-related class, and you'll see some more stuff through the email traffic on that. But that will be down in our fellowship hall starting in January. Uh, this past spring, we went through our core values as part of the Journey series, and we have chosen as a leadership team in 2012 to focus on the value of hungering for the Word. And to those ends, we're making plans as a congregation to read through the entire Bible together. Um, so you'll be hearing more about that, but we'll be doing some email things and sending some stuff out. Uh, but I encourage you to put that on your prayer list to see if that's something that you'd be willing to commit to and go through as a community, as Steve says, as we go cover to cover. So uh, hopefully it'll be something exciting for us all to do together. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. As you're turning there, I'll tell you, we've been hitting some of the, the different passages in First and Second Peter. Uh, this was not by accident. Each year I try to encourage and support those that are going through our Bible Bowl program. And those are two of the three books. They're also, uh, will be tested over the book of James. I wanted to hit just a couple of lessons that are, are fantastic out of these two letters, but also encourage them in their pursuit of, of Bible knowledge. Uh, we learned last week... Um, we discussed kind of a pattern that a lot of the writers of the biblical letters in the New Testament have laid out. And the pattern is, is before you get into the heart of the, of the, the letter, the, the reason why the author wrote them, he'll sit down and at the very beginning, he'll remind the believers of what they have in their relationship with the Lord through Jesus Christ. That that will serve as a foundation. A foundation to remind, oh, okay, okay. That's why we're together. That's what we have in common with one another. Now let's lay that out and let's build on that 
through the rest of the letter, and let me talk to you about what it means to live in response to the blessings that we have. So that's what it means to live in light of this. So let's read and see this foundation that Peter is going to lay out in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia, Asia and Lithia, and those who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. What we see here is we're kind of seeing the work of the Trinity. First, he starts with God the Father. And at the very very beginning of time, God has set out his plan. He's designed to call a holy people unto him, a people that he can call his own, a people that eventually that would become the church. What does it mean to be a part of the church? And so we see that his redemptive plan that's been there from all of time will be satisfied by God the Son. In Exodus chapter 24, there's an interesting story. God has laid out his teachings, the the covenant that he wants to have for his people. And so Moses has even been giving the people a read ahead. These are some of the things that God wants us to stress. And so he says, before we take on this as our banner as, as before we enter into this covenant relationship he said I want you to call all the people together so they built this central altar and then they have each of the tribes stack up rocks around it and he says have your young men bring a young bull to sacrifice to your tribe and so as they're preparing these bulls Moses has them take half of the blood and he pours it over each of the altars the rest he puts into bowls. And I don't know if it was just Moses himself or he had some representatives, but they begin walking among the people. It sounds kind of gross to us, but they took these bowls and then just been scattering the blood over the people. So you might get hit in the side of the face or maybe on your cloak, maybe just a drop. But this would just signify we're God's people. We become this living sacrifice before the Lord. And so... Peter is is bringing this imagery back of the sprinkling of the blood that we have through Jesus Christ. So that's what he has been given to us. And not only that, we have God the Father, what he's done, and God the Son. Well, also, he concludes with God the Spirit, who indwells this called community, not only to cleanse us, but to empower us. That's exciting, to be a chosen people for the will of God. So he lays out, this is what the Trinity has done, And grace and peace can be brought about by what they have done. Okay, well, how do we get a hold of this grace and peace? We talked about last week. Let's read on in verse 3 through 5. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith have shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in this last time. Through faith, we've been given this new birth. It's almost like we have the work of what God has done and God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. All this has taken place and we enter into that. So we leave our old life and we step over into these new blessings, a new hope as we're new creations. We, he talks about this new birth. He's going to talk about babes in Christ hungering after the milk of the Lord. So he shares this. This is what he wants us to do. So he says, I want you to understand that we have this new creation, this new life, and all that is going to be fully realized on the day of salvation when Christ comes back. He said, there's been an inheritance that's been set aside for you. Okay, so what Peter is going to do before he starts talking about how we interact, he's going to talk about we have this book in of what God has done over here, and we have this promise of this inheritance on the day to come. So what do we do in between? Well, that's what Peter is going to talk about. What's our response to what God has done for us and what God has promised to do in the future? He calls each believer to begin walking by the path of holiness. He says, start living like Jesus. Okay, do we wear the 
you know, kind of sandals and robe. No, that's not what he's talking about. But we start talking like Jesus. We start having the same priorities. I don't know about you guys, how would that fly at, at your high school or in your middle school? If you start talking about the things of Jesus, start talking about the kingdom of God, well, well they're, they're going to think I'm weird. They're going to think I'm some religious nut. Peter says, absolutely, you need to get ready for that. We need to realize how short this life is, that we've been called according to God to suffer for our, our beliefs. But he said it's not a bad thing when we go through this because this suffering refines our faith. It cements it, makes it strong, makes it genuine, makes it resilient so that God can use us more effectively within the kingdom. What does this holiness look like? Look at verse 13 and 14. Therefore, as Darren Raby used to say, if there's a therefore, we need to wonder why is it therefore? Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. What Peter is saying here is, if we see what God has done, there was a time when we didn't understand what that was, when we hadn't crossed over into this new life. He's like, why would you backtrack? Why would you do some of the things you used to do? You're now living a new existence. You're called to a life of self-control. We talked last week about we're not animals. We do have self-control. What are some of the things that we're being called to be in control about? What, what does this mean? Well, the best way that, that I can describe the change of going from the old life to the new life is my life of going from single guy to married guy. Hopefully you can resonate with this. For those of you that have not been married, you'll just have to hang in there and trust me. But before I got married, I was living with my cousin Ross. Um, we lived in a two-bedroom apartment in Waco, and let's just say it was sparsely decorated. Uh, each of us had a mattress, no box spring. The mattress is on the ground in each of our bedrooms. Uh, we didn't have a, a dining room table to eat on. We just had two recliners that we got at the thrift store. They're in the center of the living room. And in front of us, on top of cinder blocks, was a massive TV. I mean, that was all we needed. And so we'd go get takeout or frozen pizza or whatever, and we'd eat there right in our recliner. And when we got done, we'd throw our stuff on the ground, and the cat would lick it, and it was great. Okay, and, and clean up our mess. Um, let's just say that taking out the trash, cleaning the litter box, and doing laundry, those were monthly tasks when we just had to do it. I don't remember ever cleaning our bathroom. In fact, Jill made the comment when we were dating and engaged that she didn't know how we got clean in there. You know, and, but but that, that was our life. And, and life was great. There were no worries. There were no expectation between my cousin and I. Um, if, if I see you later, great. If not, I'm not going to send out the search party. You know, and the first month of Jill and I, when I moved in with her after we were married, I learned that single guy life doesn't fly with married guy wife. <laughs> and I, I had to realize that dirty clothes stacked up are not a nightstand. It doesn't work. A pizza box is no longer a bath mat. Hey, I, yeah, I was repurposing for it was cool. You know, so these are some things I had to learn, and she had to do a lot of work on me. But guess what? I'm so much better for it. Amen. All right. But you move to a different way of life, and that's what Peter is saying. He says, you need to realize, and in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, you need to grow up in your faith. It's not enough that you say, yes, I'm a believer in Jesus. Yes, I'm a child of God. He said, you need to start living like it. 1 Peter 2 and verse 1, he says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. He said, uh, you're off the hook before you met Jesus. You lived in ignorance. You didn't know. You lived like everyone else. But we don't need to return to those habits. We need to realize God's calling us to more. 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, abstain from sinful desires 
which wage war against your soul. We need to realize that we can't hold hands with the way we used to live and the way God's calling us to live. There has to be a clean break there. God has so much He wants us to do and to become. He says, I love um, later when He warns us not to waste the rest of our earthly lives by pursuing evil human desires. He said, I want you to run after the goodness of God. Run after the God's will to see what God would have you to do. Eugene Peterson conveys this in his book, The Message. 1 Peter 4 and verse 3, this is his version of You've already put in your time in that God-ignorant way of life, partying night after night, a drunken and profligate life. Now it's time to be done with it for good. And crave what God wants in your life. Crave what God would have you to be and to become. You can't do that if you're still nibbling on the old life. If you're still running after these things. What He's calling us to is to holiness. He's calling us to something so much more. Exchange your old way of living for a new life of holiness. 1 Peter 1 and verse 15 and 16 it says, But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. If we're going to run after God, just like we see in the life of, of Isaiah, when you're truly confronted in God's presence and you see who He is, He's a very holy God. He's not just holy. He's holy, holy, holy. And the, the closer we draw into God, the more that we will have to rid ourselves of the stuff of this earth. Many a card game where you're dealt out a bunch of cards and you, you know the things you want to keep, but you separate the things that need to be discarded. So you'll pull something in you need and get rid of the things you don't. It, it's a lifelong process we see in Peter. In his life, there were some things that he held on to the bitter end, but he eventually had to let go of his rage. He had to let go of, of some of his language that he was still using at the time of Christ. He had to let go of his pride. These are some of the things he discarded in order to take in the things that God would have him to be. So bet between the work of, e of the Trinity and the promise of eternity, we're called to live a holy life. Okay? For a lot of people, you're like, okay, but that's hard. Can you give me a motivation? Because it's hard letting go of some of those things, and it's hard taking on some of the things that God wants me to do. Give me some motivation, something that I, that I can tangibly grab a hold of that will help me to do it finally. The first is from this text, God will not ignore disobedience simply because we are children of God. If you ask a school teacher, this is not true for every family, but a lot of of children act the worst in the classroom when their parents show up. In fact, Jill has had to <laughs> tell a few parents, no, you can't come on the field trip. I can't take your daughter when you're along the way. Well, why does that happen? Why do sometimes children act worse when their parents are in tow? Well, a lot of times when a parent shows up into a classroom, it, it's like the, the locus of authority moves from the teacher to the parent, and the parent has lower standards for, that they anticipate out of their child than what the school does. The fact that we have been saved by grace, and we have grace with us, should not lower the standards for our behavior. It should raise the standards that we have this gift of grace from us. If we're the children of God, it needs to be visible to all like we're living it. 1 Peter 1 and verse 17 says, Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers in reverent fear. We shouldn't fit in with the world we once did. We're called to something so much greater. Our Heavenly Father is an impartial judge that looks at our actions and, and judges each person fairly. Now some of you are sitting there thinking, okay, doesn't that kind of contradict with what you preached on last week about being at peace with God? Because you're talking about God being a judge, and I, I just want to be at peace with God. God presents the path to grace and to peace with Him, but He's calling us to respond to that. The Lord will always, just like a parent, 
He will tolerate imperfection in obedient children. He'll forgive that. But willful rebellion in children is not. As strangers here, we need to realize we're answering to the Lord. We're, we're following after Him. We're, we're hungering for what He has to offer. The Lord is our Master, not this corrupt world. Well, the second reason we should pursue holiness is holiness of the messenger brings credibility to the message. The holiness of the messenger brings credibility to the message. You know, Peter is calling us to live distinctive lives. And it's not just for our benefit. He knows that if we're in the will of God, life is going to be better. We're going to be more joyful. We're not missing out if we're doing that. So it's not only for our benefit, he's also talking about, think of the gospel message. Think of what God has done in the story of Jesus. And he said, you are standard bearers. You're the witness. You're carrying around what God has done. And if you're living this life, you're going back and forth. You're saying, Jesus is important, but I've still got to have this in my life. He said it diminishes the cause of Christ. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 says, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood. It, it's, it's, it's not just for the ones that were set apart that we go and visit. He said, you're those people. You're God's representative. A people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of the darkness in His wonderful light. Skip down to verse, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in this world, abstain from, sin, from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good life among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits. Whenever I read this passage, I think of Daniel. Daniel, they knew he was living according to the book, that if there was going to be anything they were going to trip him up on, he was, not, he was a black and white guy. There was no gray in his life. They said, if we're going to go after him, it's going to have to be something with his relationship with God. Well, he prays all the time. Okay, we'll make it illegal to pray. May people look at our lives and see that we are living such good lives, not to our glory, but to God's glory on the day he visits. You know, if you present yourself as someone belonging to God, you need to live in such a way that others will want to find out more. If you're living in the shadows, kind of with one foot in the old world and one foot over here, how appealing is that? It's just not. Last Saturday, I made my weekly visit. I either go to Home Depot or Lowe's. I, I, I feel compelled to go to both to keep both afloat. But, uh, but I, I go there all the time. And I was buying some uh, wainscoting. These long boards were a project I was doing at the house. And I had a bunch of things stacked on one of those flat carts where you can't really see everything because I had a bunch of the stuff stacked up. And I had four packages. When I was watching the cash register, I noticed that he clicked on the top two packages and the other two were offset underneath where he couldn't see them. So I called it to his attention. I said, listen, there's, there's two, two more packages under there you've missed. And he stopped what he was doing. And he said, I can't tell you how few people would have done what you just did. And... Uh, I wasn't you know, consciously thinking about any of this. It was just the right thing to do. But I got to thinking in my mind, you know, I don't know if I'll ever be given the opportunity to present the gospel message to this young man, but I'm certainly not going to sacrifice that opportunity over $30 in, in paneling. I'm just not going to do it. God calls us to live such good lives. And I hate to say it in the world around us, it doesn't take much to stand out. This society needs holy people. This society needs a group of people that says, I'm going to be different. I'm going to do the right thing, even if it's costly to me. Well, the final reason we're called to be holy is holy living is inspired by the high cost of salvation. You know, it's one thing for the Israelites to carry an innocent lamb to go and, and take on the sin and to be sacrificed for the sin of the family. I mean, it was something completely different for God's only Son to come and do that for us. 1 Peter 1 and verse 18 and 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, without defect. You know, this whole phrase, you're redeemed, 
I think sometimes we, we lose a little bit of that based on what's going on in, in our culture. But back then, it, it would have conjured up image of a captive being released from an enemy or maybe a, a slave from a master being set free. And so th- th- this price has been paid so that the other could be let go. Unfortunately, we found out exactly what that meant a few weeks ago. A story on Sunday morning, the 25th of June, 2006, about 5.30 in the morning, an army squad of Palestinian militants from the Gaza Strip crossed over into Israel. They had dug an underground tunnel near Karim Shalom border crossing. And when they broke free, the first thing that they saw over in the corner, out of the corner of their eye, was a large tower, and they took it out. Below the tower was a tank, and this militant group came up to the tank and with a rocket-propelled grenade, shot into the back of the tank and blew open the, the back end, the back door. First thing they did is they took a handheld grenade and threw it in there. Two of the four crew members were killed instantly. One was severely damaged. But Gilad Shalit, a corporal, was taken from the tank at gunpoint and immediately escorted back down through the tunnel to the safety of the Gaza Strip. He was the first Israeli that's been captured by the Palestinians since 1994. For five years, this corporal has been held in a secret location in the Gaza Strip until October 18th when he was brought back in a prisoner exchange. Israeli President Benjamin Netanyahu was criticized, not by his opposition, but by those within his own borders. The fellow Jews had criticized him for the terms he agreed to in this prisoner exchange. What did it cost him? 450 Palestinians, 280 of which were serving life sentences without parole. 131 Hamas operatives that have been living in Gaza, 27 female terrorists. All total, 1,027 Israeli-held security prisoners known to have been responsible for 569 deaths of Israeli civilians. All these let go for the life of one corporal that manned a tank gunner. Why would he do this? Why the imbalance? Here's simply what the president said. We can't leave a man to rot in the jihadi dungeon. You know, this story sounds absurd, but in a lot of ways, that's our story, isn't it? But I need to tell you, we're not Gilad Shalit, the innocent that was taken. We are the riffraff that was let go. Amen. We are the misfits, the ruined sinners, the enemies of God that have been released in the prisoner exchange that God did with Satan so we would not rot in his cellars. We've been pardoned for our transgressions so we can be reclaimed as his own. It was such a high price. Of course we appreciate that and it should drive us to holiness. In Christ, we have not only the pattern for holiness, we also have the reason for holiness. It should drive us to that. We respond just as Jesus Christ responded in the garden. Not my will, but yours be done. Peter sums up this whole passage in this section in this way. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. As we enter into our time of communion, let's pray together. Lord, whether it is out of reverent fear for you, or whether it is a desire to be an authentic witness to the story that you have given us, it's our story, but it's also the story of those that need to be reclaimed. Or Lord, if it's out of an acknowledgement of the great sacrifice of your precious Son given in our stead, may we strive to walk in holiness. Lord, as we take of this bread, as ransom sinners, dear Lord, we celebrate the body of your Son, Jesus. Lord, that makes all this possible. 
We thank you for that rich, rich blessing. It's his name we pray. Amen.